Hey, my guest speaker on this episode is Jack Dora, somebody who has a range of experience in property, but right now has been focusing on the planning system, how to get uplifting property through permitted development of prior approval rights. He also shares a deal that he did for one pound that made more than one and a half million pounds in terms of profit on that particular deal. And regardless of whether you're starting out in property, you have some experience or very experienced, he shares some great tips there as well. So let's head straight over into the episode. If I come across someone who is not humble, um, I tend to not work with that person. That's my key thing. Second is values, at least to some extent. Someone who's a communicator. You know, if there's a, a ups and downs in, in the business, and there always is, the person is prepared to sit down with you and communicate. Yes. Um, and and it's I call them leadership skills, really. But it's not something you can learn overnight. Yes. You know, reading the body language, yes. reading the person behind the scene. Uh, you learn with time, but it's a it's an essential skill to have. Every time when you look at a potential deal you look at it and ask okay what is it different that we can do in that deal mm. in fact it's almost like reverse engineering every single time so even when you're looking at a deal you look you don't just ask how can I maximize the value and how what what different can I do with this building but what would be the exit because a lot of people look at deals but they never think of the exit and they yeah. suffer Jack, you've done some very interesting deals. One of the ones is you had an option on a property for one pound and then you sold that option for 1.7 million. That is right. That's a phenomenal amount of a profit in a deal like that. Talk us through what that is and how that worked. So we took an option agreement on a really large detached house and uh, agreed price 1.1 million after 24 months delayed completion. And we applied for planning permission. Uh, planning permission we got for six flats and two semis. Okay. And then so it was to demolish the site, demolish the site, build a pair of semi-detached houses and a block of six, six apartments. Flats, okay. That's right. And uh, the cost to us was 20 grand, architects, legals, planning, drug consultants. Right. And then eventually we sold option for 1.7 without developing it. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, so that's you didn't purchase the, uh, the We the didn't site. purchase you, you the sold site, for no. 1.7 no, uh, million. That's right, yes. So uh, it'd be nice to do deals like that every day of the uh, week. I'm guessing uh, you spotted something many other people missed in that. Yes. So what actually happened was we developed the site besides it. Uh, we literally, again, bought the site. That was the first site that, that we bought. And then... Um, we developed it against exactly the same six flats, two semis. Mm -hmm. So we had president set for the one next door, right. which is exactly, in fact, slightly smaller than, than this plot. Uh, but then uh, we already knew that we were going to get planning. Yes. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, gold mine areas. I just don't believe in that anymore. It's more about smaller pockets of where, in, in fact, something that I was discussing earlier with you, yes. which is uh, a lot of people say, you know, m property market is saturated. Mm. And I feel the opposite of saturated is, creating yes. that means you're creating sites or uh, properties that don't exist so there's no deal if you might turn up and say oh there's no not enough profitable deals yes. in the market but that are you skilled enough or knowledgeable enough to create sites which may not exist as yet through planning gain yes and that's uh, that's what we work on that's something my complete focus is on in terms of property we don't touch nothing else these days uh, that's where it is so planning again, we'll touch on that and explore it more in a, in a short while. Um, just to help people understand this particular uh, deal a little bit more and get their head around it. Uh, so this is in uh, uh, in London? In London, in yes. London. Yeah. And uh, so you'd already developed the one uh, site and then the next door one had become available. Um, so when you are looking at something like that and when you are committing uh, to it, what are the key things that you were looking for? What were the key metrics that were important for you to make the deal work? So, so one of the important things when you're looking for deals like that is precedent set in the region. Okay. So let's say you walk down the road and you see a large plot, a really large detached house or a corner plot, let's, mm -hmm. let's say, and you literally walk down the road on the same road, a few houses down, you see a block of flats. Mm. That's a very good example to say, okay, if this has got planning for potentially four, six, eight, nine flats or whatever, yes the likely is that you may get or likely, highly likely going to okay. get planning for, uh, yes. you know, multiple units. But then other things that you need to be aware of is the game is to reach the full potential or maximize the land value. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot maximize the land value, then there's no deal there. 
Yes. So it's almost like reverse engineering the appraisal and actually looking at the, the current value of the plot or the, the property that you might be looking at and saying, if let's say it's worth a million, let's say, you know, the, the landlord might give for a million, can we increase the value of that to, let's say, 1.5 or 2 million or whatever? Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, then there's no deal there. Yes. And so it's almost like reverse engineering your appraisal. Uh, that is a good thing to look at. That That's the main point to look at. So you start with the end value, exactly. what it's going to be worth exactly. at the end. You take off your costs associated yep. with it and your profit margin exactly. that you need to create. What you're left with, exactly. the residual value is what you can afford to pay for that side. That is right. But if you, the, what you can afford to pay has to be more than what it's worth at the moment. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. there's no point in developing it. Yes. Uh, and many times people will look at numbers and do that process and say, oh, well, they want 500,000 for it, but if my numbers work out 350. Yeah. How can I get them to accept it? And we say, well, you, you can't necessarily, because yeah. why would they sell it for 150,000 exactly, pounds less yeah. than what it is? Exactly. In fact, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that it's not just about maximizing land value. You walk in, you know, wh why would someone give you an option agreement yes. if there is no incentive on top of what the market value is? Yeah. And the only way to incentivize a landlord is by saying, okay, it's worth about a million, but then when I get planning permission, I'd be able to give you, let's say, 1.1 or 1.2. And that's the main incentive for a landlord to say yes. Otherwise, why would they give it to you on an option agreement in the first place? Yeah. So essentially what you're what you're doing is you're paying or offering to pay above market value, yes. hence why they would give you the right to buy it at some point in the future. Based Otherwise, on why would they? It exactly. doesn't, doesn't make sense. So, Subject to, exactly, yeah. yeah. So you're deferring when you would purchase it. Yes. As long as you can increase the value, exactly. then you would purchase it. Exactly. So in yeah. this particular example, the one we were talking about, yeah. so you, you went through the planning uh, process, you got the uplifting value, yeah. but then you didn't purchase, yeah. you you gave that right to somebody else. Trading to your be space. Able to develop. Yes. So you're trading your space. So you're literally trading the agreement that you have in place and someone else is mm -hmm. going to develop that. And I guess uh, when a deal is a little bit tight, you can always bring the seller into the deal yes. and say, we'll give you a portion of the uplift uh, exactly. Um, if, exactly. uh, to try and make the numbers work. There is a million ways to structure a deal in terms of how you negotiate. Mm -hmm. You can uh, just sign an option agreement if you have a good relationship with the landlord, or you can give them incentive saying, we'll give you 10% or 20% of the uplift in the game yes. or whatever you can negotiate at that point. Uh, but, but there's a lot of ways to, to negotiate a deal. Yeah. And then when it comes to finding the right people to work with, like uh, architects, there are lots of architects around, there are lots of drafts people around, yeah. people that can uh, draw something nice visually for you. But drawing something on a screen or a piece of paper is very different to getting approval right, to yeah. be able to build that That's right, yes. through planning. So what uh, suggestions would you have in trying to find the right professionals? Uh, this is a question I was, in fact, I was asked yesterday in a session that I was doing, and I said, Fortunately, unfortunately, at the same time, it takes time to filter people in your life to get to a point where you know this is the right person to work with. And the, yes. the, the key things that I look for is values mm -hmm. and humility at the core. If I come across someone who is not humble, um, I, I tend to not work with that person. That's my key thing. Second yeah. is values, at least to some extent, someone who's a communicator. You know, if there's a uh, ups and downs in, in in the business and there always is mm -hmm. uh, the person is prepared to sit down with you and communicate yes um and and it's i call them leadership skills really but it's not something you can learn overnight yes. you know reading the body language yes. reading the person behind the scene uh you learn with time but it's a it's an essential skill to have to mm -hmm. be able to get to a point where you can create those contacts people that you know you really get along with and then you can actually help them reach full potential as you yes. were saying uh help the deal reach full potential while you are developing yourself as a leader. Yes, yeah. yes. One thing I found quite uh, useful is, uh, so we, uh, you talk about example, if there's already a block of apartments built nearby, that's a good indicator you may be able to do this again, depending on how long ago it was done, uh, is to jump on the planning portal and download the relevant documents yeah. for that particular site and find who were the consultants, yes. who were the architects. Exactly, Reach that's another way of looking at it. Perfect, yes. And uh, that I found works quite well. It I have got my really fingers well. burnt on that yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. Because on one example, what happened yeah. is I found somebody who managed to get um, uh, eight bed approvals mm -hmm. on a HMOs mm -hmm. in a challenging area. And I yeah. thought, this guy clearly knows what he's doing, yeah. so I should reach out to him. Yeah. And he said all the right things, gave him the job, made a complete mess of it and realized he'd really fluked the first ah. one rather than having a track record of okay, these. Okay. But so it's not a it's not a foolproof method, but it's that a is, good start. It's a good start. It's a Definitely good start to finding start, people yeah, exactly. who have some have some experience. Exactly. Yeah. 
Hey, surrounding yourself by the right people has made a massive difference in my property journey. And I have a program called the Inner Circle Program, which is a mentoring program essentially helping you get further faster in your property investing journey and avoiding the mistakes. That's essentially what we focus on, so accelerate your results. And the program isn't really just about me supporting you on this journey, but I have eight different mentors that help and support you through the program as well. And one of those is especially the planning system, the kind of things we've been talking about in this podcast. So if you want to learn a little bit more about how I can help and support you in your property investing journey through our mentoring program, make sure you follow the link on the screen now or in the description below. So let's now head back over to the podcast. And when we talk about creative deals like this, yeah. These are the kind, not the kind of things we could take to a run the mill high street solicitor and say, here, this is the deal. No, you can't. How do we make it no, work? No, you can't. And uh, so what is it that we are looking for in uh, legal experts to help us with that, do you think? Uh, I, I, I'd normally straight ask, have you done deals like that? Yes. Like literally. The track record. If, if It's the same with architects as well. It's the same with planners as well. I'd ask for track record. And if they're not yes. prepared to you know, show me the track record, I, I may not work with them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just track record. Have you done option deals yes. before? Option agreements are not very different from really like a, any agreement when you exchange a contract. Yeah. It's just a few words and wordings yes. within it. But it has to be very tight because if let's say you you take an option agreement, it's legally not tight enough. Mm. The landlord could sell the property and then you've got nothing in your hand. It has to be registered as well. In fact, something not, not means pe most people know, they would download option agreements, sign up with the with the landlord, and then later when they get in trouble with it, they, they've nowhere, nowhere to go. Yes. But if you go to a, a, the right solicitor, they, they will get it registered, which means the landlord actually cannot sell the property without yes. your permission. Yeah, some people talk about, oh, we could just find an option agreement online or somebody oh, sent it no. to them and things. And I guess, you, you know, you could do that, but enforcing it and legally, it can be a challenge. Uh, and uh, I'd come across some guys uh, quite some years ago now when I, I when I was doing option agreements, uh, um, probably uh, 2009, 10, 11 is when I did a lot of lease option stuff and assisted sales. Uh, and then not so many after that. At that point, there's somebody else I'd met, a couple of guys who were doing really well in this strategy. And they'd done a, a, a great deal with a solicitor, a great deal in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. But what happened is they didn't quite do the paperwork correctly. Mm -hmm and the owner was a solicitor. Oh, okay. So he took advantage at the end and yeah. didn't allow them to exercise the right. Yeah. So they'd spent all this money renovating yeah. this property yeah. and they couldn't exercise the right by it. Yeah. And it almost wiped them out, yeah. uh, this deal. So yeah. absolutely not doing the paperwork correctly yeah. or getting the legals right, you could uh, get your fingers burnt so much. Get your, get your option agreement registered because yes. it gets registered on the title, on the, yeah. which means then they cannot sell the property yeah. without your permission. Yes. Simple. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't cost a lot. Two grand to a, a solicitor to save yourself losing a quarter of a million or a million pound. Especially when there's large numbers. At exactly, stake. yeah. And so then on exiting your particular one, why, uh, to help people understand, why would somebody pay you such a large amount of money when you paid so little? Yeah. What's in it for that person to, to buy from you? Here is, the, here is something that, again, everything, everything that we, we look at in life is paradoxical. There's advantages and disadvantages to everything. But most people do not have enough clarity to find sites with potential. Mm -hmm. So they go into the market, look for on-market sites. That's what most people yes. even right now do. They'll, you know, there'll be developers, there'll be builders, they go into the market. And normally most deals in the market are at, you know, appraised backwards, reverse engineered at 20% net profit margin. Why would someone buy it at that price is because they don't know how to spot opportunities themselves. So they just go into the market and buy what's available. Mm. Okay. But at the same time, it's a game of, if you're watching and you want to play this game, for example, it's about understanding the depth of planning. Mm. It's about the depth of understanding where you can create a deal which is what, we, what I was sharing yes. earlier with you that it's a saturated market and I find saturated Opposite of that is creating deals yeah. where none exist. So you might look at a brownfield site or you might look at a, a, a site that's underdeveloped, for example. Uh, I was walking around literally last week uh, with a couple of colleagues and we came across this site where there's a, a small, almost like an outhouse uh, beside, besides a, a detached house. Okay. And I was looking at it and I was thinking, there's a potential to literally build a, a detached house there. Right. And but I wasn't completely sure. There's never, like no one has, or not most people don't have a clear answer. Even I didn't have that point. Yes. And I'm, I'm digging deeper into that site as we speak. Uh, but if we can get a, a detached house there, that would be worth easy 800, 900,000 pounds. Right. Uh, this is in Iva. 
okay. uh, near, near Heathrow. And, and so we're looking at that. If we can get to that point and take an option agreement, uh, we'll probably be able to agree that at a quarter of a million, build wise, a quarter of a million, yeah. there's a, a potential maximizing land value by about 300,000. Yes. And there's not a lot of work to do behind that, if, if I may yes. say. So a lot of, it's almost like comparing, uh, you, you know, you, you're gonna work on planning uplift game and likewise, you're gonna actually develop the site. Mm -hmm. the, the amount of effort you put in, in, in planning uplift space in terms of developing it. So the effort here is a lot more on, on the yes. developing part, yeah. while the effort on planning uplift is a lot less, but it's a lot more complicated. Planning yes. game is way more complicated. There's too, way too many aspects to consider. But at the same time, it's almost like, okay, are you actually going to dig deeper mm -hmm. and understand the game? And, and when you actually are selling these like that, so for example, you've taken planning uh, game, you've reverse engineered it, you put it in the market, you come across someone who's showing interest, and then if you've left 20% net profit margin for them, which is what you would see most on market deals on, then you could always say, okay, instead of 20, maybe give them 22%, but then they're likely to sign that deal because for them, 22% yes. means they're almost, you know, more attractive. it's a lot more attractive. They, they, when, you, when you look at that, if it's, let's say, leveraged by about one third, mm -hmm. even at 22% margin, you're making about 50, 60% on your money, Yes, which is still very attractive for a builder or a developer. Yeah. And I guess a builder developer would buy sites like that yeah. and like your site as yeah. well, because they it's ready to go. It's ready to go. There's nothing that they need to, they don't need to go through the risk and uncertainty of planning. Exactly. You've de-risked it that's and right. taken the uncertainty away. And that's what people will pay you for. And because I guess it's so complex planning, yeah. which is why you can create such a big uplift. That's right. So, uh, you know, a piece of land over there where you can just park cars on yeah. versus planning permission to build a tower you know, 20 stories high. That is right, yes. Completely different values. Completely Why? Different because value. one, it comes with the right exactly. to be able to build on it. And I guess planning really is an area of law. Yeah. It's it's not design, it's not architect, yeah. it's an area of law, law that unfortunately few people understand. understand. And those that understand it well really capitalize on it. And it doesn't mean that you have to master the skill yourself, yeah. but you can surround yourself so with, with people, people who understand understand right. this well. That is right. And you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I like to think I've got good knowledge of planning, but I'm by no means an expert, yeah. but we've got very good experts we turn to that is, to get them involved. That's and what we us. are supposed to do. Yes. That's, in fact, another advantage that most people have, why, why they take deals like that is because they need to fill a pipeline. Yes. You know, they've got, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 builders that they've hired, yes. um, you know, traders, professionals, they, so on and so they need to keep that yes. pipeline filled. So they'd go in the market, pick up that's 20, 20, 22 yes. percent uh, net profit margin. They just keep filling the pipeline. Yes. Yeah. So you, you talked about uh, uh, creating deals that don't exist or in a market that's, uh, say, saturated and people think, oh, there's no opportunities. Yeah. Um, uh, and somewhere in my mind, I would consider potentially saturated is like Blackpool, for example. Oh, there's lots of uh, bed and breakfasts and stuff. But you've turned uh, a really nice deal there. Tell us a little bit more about that <laughs> one. That's an interesting deal. It, it actually came in the market at 350, 350,000. Yeah. And it's, it was a 20 bed operational hotel. And when I went the first time, I came back out and I called the agent put an offer in really low offer because I, I, w w the person who was showing me the property was the owner and I could see they're old school, they didn't have enough knowledge. They said, you know, are you, do you know about booking.com? I'm like, okay, so I could, I could sense that, the, you know, they're old school, they don't know the technology. Mm -hmm. So I, I could see there was a deal. So I put in a really low offer, but then it was taken immediately, like literally an hour later, it was taken by someone else. Okay. So the deal is gone. I'm like, okay, it doesn't matter. Then it came back in the market because the person who had agreed couldn't get finance. Right. Because right. uh, that would probably be based on uh, track record activity of that business. Because exactly. you're buying a business. Exactly. You're buying a business. If that business doesn't have the, the revenue and profitability, exactly. you're not going to be able to borrow exactly, against it. Exactly, yeah. So, so, so they, they pulled out. And then when it came back in the market, again, me, the first one going back in, uh, I, I met the landlord again. I said, you know what? If you want cash, we'll bring all cash in as long as we can negotiate the deal. Yes. I called the agent back again. We got the deal agreed at 220 Okay. So there's a 130 grand discount right from day yes. one. Uh, and even when we were going through legals, I was skeptical if we were going to close the deal at that price. Okay. So Thinking it would, they might back out? Oh, or? they might back out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Someone could just go in and say, look, your property is worth money, okay. a lot more than this. And how about if I give you a higher offer? And that, this happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, the challenge of legals, property legals in the country. So we closed the deal at 220. We spent another... 
65 grand on it uh, between you know refurbing and adding more space and so on and so forth we converted it into 31 bed hotel okay. and now it's less uh, leased out on a fri lease for five years and it's bringing in 47000 pound rental income that's almost wow. uh, about just shy of a thousand a week yeah uh, but then we bought it completely cash. When I was buying it, I didn't have none of my own money. Yes. I borrowed money. I paid the money back. We have a complete, you know, unencumbered yes. hotel uh, that's uh, generating rental income. So even from a valuation point of yeah. view, if it's, it's worth well over half 000. a million, yeah. yeah, it's well over half a million now. Yeah. yeah. And so with that particular one, so you've added it gone from about twenty to thirty rooms. It's gone from twenty to thirty-one rooms. Yeah. yeah. And so you haven't added extensions no. to to create the additional rooms. Yeah. You reconfigured, Just reconfigured what's already there. Yes, yes. So, what kind of things is it that you spotted and looked for to increase that that you think other people maybe miss? One one of the things that happens in in apart hotels or hotels is when people book rooms, most people. They're just looking at the price. Mm. They're not looking at the size of the room. Yes. So, especially in town hotels or city hotels, you know, you normally get very smaller rooms for the value that you pay. And that's when we looked at the hotel. There were some rooms which are not getting used for various reasons. You know, there was pipe work issues, there was bathroom issues, right. sewage issues. There's all sorts of problems within the hotel. So we reconfigured some of that and added all of those rooms. Okay. It's not very difficult when you do that because as long as you know the smallest room size, mm. uh, if you need it en suite, you don't need en suite. If you know the basics of even converting something into a HMO, yeah. which are really, really basic, yeah. uh, you can actually reconfigure and, and just create more rooms, create yes. more space. Uh, even right now, uh, I'm actually thinking uh, that there's, there's space on the ground floor. We're also thinking of applying for planning permission for a, a floor above. Okay. If we end up doing that, we add another 10 rooms yes. to the hotel. Uh, and the aim is, it's not about uplifting value of the hotel itself. Yes, that's an advantage, but it's more about increasing the rental value yes. uh, because that creates more uh, passive yes. income. And and but we are some that's something that's on paper that we're thinking of applying for as well. Yes. So with that, uh, I guess what we'd be looking for is what's going to be the cost of that additional yeah, number exactly. of units to create that, and how much income they're going to generate. Very so you look at your return on exactly. investment on the on the additional works exactly. that you're going to do. And I think the nice thing about uh, apart hotels and hotels, and we've got a scheme at the moment we're doing, uh, and there's some interesting learnings in that. There's no minimum room sizes as there such. Is. Just like there is in HMOs, there's a minimum room yeah. size. Um, and even uh, you could have rooms with no windows. Uh, I mean, it's not desirable, it's not yeah, practical, yeah. Um, but it's just, it's crazy that actually there is none of this uh, exists. There, there isn't, yeah. And there, there are isn't. hotels uh, I, I haven't seen personally, but I've heard uh, in the UK that they've got no windows in the, uh, uh, in the, in the yeah. rooms. Funny enough, you mentioned uh, w one of the rooms in one of our hotels has no window. Okay. And it has been passed by the council guys because they walked in. And you know there was there was some issues. I guess as long as you've got air ventilation exactly, yeah. and uh, as long as you've got fire escape route, they're the things they, you might they, not have a pretty view to look yeah. at. But at least it's yeah. a it's a room. Again, you, you have to look at any deal from the financial perspective and the the the, the ethical way of looking at a deal. Yes. But yeah. So when you're looking at uh, you know creating an opportunity, especially uh, when we talk about the saturated market, you know a lot of people say, oh, the market saturated. I can't find deals. I'm struggling to find deals. What do you think? you are visualizing different to maybe many other people are that they're missing? In, in fact, I'd like to mention this, this is something important. I, I read this book and I actually invited the author to one of our events, which was uh, uh, Paul Sloan. His book is Lateral Thinking. Okay. And one of the things that I learned from that book and I, and I and actually apply it in my life is, every time when you look at a potential deal, mm -hmm. You look at and ask, okay, what is it different that we can do in that deal? Mm. In fact, it's almost like reverse engineering every single time. So even when you're looking at a deal, you look, you don't just ask, how can I maximize the value and how, what, what different can I do with this building? But what would be the exit? Because a lot of people look at deals, but they never think of the exit and they yeah. suffer. Yes. I always see that. And I, when I'm looking at deal, appraising a deal, I'm always looking at it. Okay. First, what can I do differently with this deal? How can I maximize the land value? It's almost like open, creative questions you're asking yourself and, and, and also exit. Like clearly, most people that I know just do not ask the question of what is the exit here? So if you have a clear exit right from day one, mm -hmm. you know exactly what to do with that building. So 
in fact, with this hotel, when I was doing it, when we were doing it, I was thinking, okay, do I run it myself? In fact, I actually managed that hotel for some time myself when it was going through the refurb. And then we, we rented it out. Um, but but I, I clearly had it in my mind that I'm actually, at some point, we will you know, give it to a corporate company, okay. rent it out, and then get a commercial valuation at the back of that. Mm. Uh, and that's something not a lot of people, it's almost like you always look at options and say, okay, can you manage it yourself if it's worth it? if it's worth the, the, the time investment, if it's worth the money investment, and then you look at the other option, so okay, do I rent it out on an FRI lease? What would be the end value? Who would be the potential buyer of this? Who can I reach out to? I think these are the questions most people don't really ask. Yes. Okay? Yeah. yeah. I just I'm thinking just on that hotel, if you had renovated it, got it up and running, then operated it yourself, you'd yeah. probably have to run it two, maybe three years yeah. to build up the books yeah. in order to be able to borrow exactly. against it. Exactly. And this way, by giving it as an FRI lease yeah. and just leasing it out and yeah. somebody else responsible, that lease has now added significant value. You exactly. could go and refinance if you wanted exactly. to straight off the back of, uh, right. back of that lease. Yeah. Um, so how, how did you get involved in property? Take us back a little bit. <laughs> how did you end up in this space? I am a very cliche, it might sound, I'm an excellent landlord. I bought my first one in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, like I walked in into a property, it was a very uh, sort of a, a buzz market and bought the first one. I think I paid like 56,000. That was a property in Walsall, actually. Oh, right, okay. Um, and uh, I, I lived in Walsall. I was going to say 56,000 won't get you much around London. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. Uh, but that was, I, I, I used to live in Walsall at that point. Yes. And uh, yeah, just excellent landlord. I used to run uh, my, my different business. I used to run a chauffeur company. Uh, so I was making quite decent money to be able to take money yes. from that business and invest into a tangible product. Uh, it was, so yeah, just, and, and then I ended up buying a few more properties in the journey. And then uh, 2014, we sold our chauffeur company, and then I got involved into property 2017 full time. Uh, we built PEN, which is Property Entrepreneurs Network, one of the yes. one of the largest networks in the country. Uh, we grew pretty fast through COVID as well. We reached a half a million people network. Wow! And then we ended up losing one of the biggest groups on Facebook, 450,000 people group on Facebook. Really? Yeah, wow, major hit. But we're still growing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time. I always look at any business as a network. So if let's say you're a property investor or, or aspire to be one, remember, if you need money, mm -hmm. you still need to have a network. Yes. If you still need deals, you still need to have a network. Yes. Uh, so network plays a major part. Yeah, I'm but certainly that's... a big fan of networking and you know, hence why we run our physical networking exactly. event. We've been doing probably 12 years. I've been running networking events. There's enormous value in meeting people, connecting with people. And that's why I love doing these podcasts yeah. as well. Although we've known each other a few years, yeah. we have never really had a chance to sat down exactly. and have a chat and stuff. So, uh, you know, just this format, uh, you know, it means that we get to connect and meet more people. Exactly. And everybody could do that. And everybody yes. should be thinking about how can I connect and grow my, uh, my network. Yeah. And when somebody's starting out in property, what what kind of thinking advice would you give them if they're if they're trying to find their path and just get started? I always say that most people, again, I, I find this is my observation is they just don't have enough clarity. Mm. Clarity plays a major part. And, and I've been through that journey where I've started something and I don't quite enjoy it. And because I don't enjoy it, I don't. It's almost like you never get to the depth of it. Yeah. OK. And if you want to. Always look at, uh, just, it's almost like reflect, reflecting back at your childhood and say, what did you really enjoy? Mm. And, and I always say, life is too short to do things that you don't enjoy. Mm. Like, why would, you, why would you do something that you don't enjoy? And, and, and there's very few aspects in my business. It's, it's never black and white answer, right? I, even right now, there's things in my business that I do that I might not enjoy, but there's very few of it. Yes. There's a lot more of it that I'd really enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've got to reflect on your childhood and say, what is it that you really enjoyed? Yes. Do you enjoy renovating properties? Okay. Do you like building houses? Uh, or do you just want to sit on rental income and say, okay, I want to enjoy my life and travel and so on and so forth. But remember, there's property is a very tangible investment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and other businesses may not be. So that's a very clear distinction. At the same time, when you look at from a strategic point of view, are you coming into property or aspire to be into property with, are you coming into with some skills? Are you coming with very little skills into the picture? Um, because even skills wise, you have the, the, the interpersonal skills or leadership skills, and then you have the technical skills. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, are you coming with resources? Are you coming with your own money? Or are you coming with very little money or maybe a little bit of money? Uh, so you've got to look at 
very strategically and say, where, where, what strategy can I focus on? And again, a lot of people don't don't have this clarity. If you if you're coming in with little money, or what kind of risk appetite do you have? You know, if you're going to work in property, it, it, you can you can work on a strategy that is very little risk, like a rent to HMO, for example, or a rent to rent, for example. I find rent to rent not necessarily the best strategy, but rent to HMO is more uh, more safer, mm -hmm. uh, less risk, I must say. So if you are coming into the picture. It, it, you know, and you want to start, you can start with rent to HMO. It doesn't need lots of money either. You can start with as little as 10 grand, uh, you know, acquire two or three and then okay. carry on scaling that. At the same time, if you're coming with a little bit more money, you can work on flips, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're coming with a, a lot more money than that, or you may know people around you that are sitting on lots of money, you can start with maybe a couple of units, two or three block units that you can start with. But make sure you 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 shadow developers because yes. you can make major mistakes when you're starting out. If you initially start to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to go and do four units or five units, uh, there are lots of things that you need to be uh, cautious about. Yes. Uh, and, and you know this more than yeah. I do, that you could just... Uh, uh, because I'm a finance broker, I tend to see a lot more deals. Mm. And I come across so many people. They walk into auction, they've seen this property, 70, 80, 100 grand. They, they pay and then they realize after paying that the refurb that they were thinking was 20 grand now turns out to be 50 or 100 grand yes. and then eventually there's either no money left in the deal and or they're going to lose the money so it's always good to maybe just shadow people it's, yes. it's completely underestimated what value someone can bring to your life when you're shadowing someone who knows what they're doing mm. like like yourself for yeah, example I, I i uh i agree with you when someone's starting out it's thinking about those resources, what you're bringing, what time, skill, experience are you actually been able to exactly. bring to the table? How can you leverage that further? And, you know, we don't know what we don't know at yes. that stage. And yeah. how can you de-risk that by kind of, you know, getting the knowledge to avoid making some mistakes in that process? Yeah. And so somebody, let's say somebody's already in property, they've been doing property maybe a short while, maybe they have two or three property, then a few deals, but now they're becoming a little bit stagnated because the market's constantly changing and evolving and they're not quite sure what to do. What would you suggest to somebody like that? Look for market changes in terms of policy. Mm. Because if lately you look at some of the changes that have come, commercial to resi, for example, mm. which is normally under PD, which is permitted development, spend some time reading GDPO, mm -hmm. okay? which is your permitted development, GP, GPDO uh, document. General and permitted development. General permitted development, yeah. right? Go and read that uh, because what you will see is you'll come across deals where it's you don't necessarily need to apply for a full stack planning permission. It's a part of PD, which means that it's a lot more easier to add value. Mm. And, and, and if you have done some deals and you don't know, uh, you know, you've stagnated, like you said, uh, maybe look at look at that. Yes. You know, there's there's lots and lots of deals out there. Uh, commercial. W when you look at High Street, for example, yes, there are restrictions on what you can do, but lately, because of the changes in the law and policy, uh, th there is a lot more scope to build residential units mm -hmm. up units above that. Uh, lo look at that. Like I said, creating deals is a skill and a half, and there's you, you can never learn everything. It's impossible, but but the more you learn, the more depth you look at. Uh, in fact, let me share a very inter interesting story. I met a property consultant back in 2003 when I was buying my first property. Mm -hmm. And he actually literally asked me on my face, what do you make in six months? And I was like, you know, strange question. And I said, okay, I, I make X amount of money. He goes, take six months off and just do research on gaining knowledge on property and planning gain. Okay. Now, back in 2003, I almost knew nothing about property. All I knew was, buy buy to let properties rent them out yes. you've got a little bit of cash flow that's all i knew yes but when i reflect back on that story when he said take six months off and you're going to lose x amount of money but you'll be able to double that just by gaining that knowledge yes and then applying that and insist on applying that not just gaining knowledge applying that you can make you can double that money just spend some time learning the depth mm. of creating deals in spaces where none exist. Yes. Uh, with, with permitted development, with planning uplifts, you know, you can walk around and you might see a derelict building. You might see, you know, there's, we, we, have, we have the baby boomer generation where you walk around and there's, you know, you can see a, a, a very old car parked outside. It's not being cleaned. The house hasn't been cleaned. You, 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 you can immediately tell 
that there's a baby boomer living there 70 plus years or whatever, there's likely a deal there. If it's a, a deta detached house, you know, stuff like that, there's, there's things that you can look out for to be able to create deals. And if you are, a, 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 like you said, you've done a few deals and you want to get to the next level, the depth of creating deals is where I would look at if I was you. Yes. And there's the, the summer changes that have happened yeah. under planning in the last few years. Yeah. Uh, and there's enormous opportunities under permitted development of prior approval. Yeah. Uh, when you look in the nuances of what's possible, it's mind blowing it's the kind of things yeah. you can do. Yeah. And yes, there's certain quirks and caveats and things, but actually there's so many ways to get around some of the planning challenge, the challenges that exist uh, just by being aware of those. I, I think that's uh, that's definitely a good shout. Let's say, let's talk about somebody now that let's say way more experienced. Let's say somebody uh, comes to you, they're very experienced in property, they've been doing it a long time, they're getting a bit tired as well now. Um, what kind of suggestion or guidance would you give them? Is it a case of just enjoy your portfolio now, forget it, start downsizing, buy to let is dead, or what's your thoughts? <laughs> I, I have been saying that buy to let is dead. Mm. It's not completely dead. There's never there's never a black and white answer to that. It's just not attractive as it's it used to be. It's not as attractive yeah. as it used to be. So when someone calls me up and most people still talk about buy to let vanilla investments, I always say, look, there's 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 better strategies out there that you can focus on, you can make money out of it. But if if you if you are at that point in life where you've done lots of deals, here is what I am focused on purely because I want to invest as little time being a young father, it's like another business in and itself looking after the young ones. I want to spend as much time or invest as little time, sorry, as, invest as little time and be able to make as much money. Yes. And the only way I look at, when, when I look at the whole strategic landscape of property, and I've been through most of those deals, if I, if I may say so, I look at them and think, the best one is by far planning lifts mm. because you don't have to go and hire builders. You don't have to go and hire plumbers and electricians and in you know, a whole bunch of other professionals behind the scene. You don't have to hire people full time basis, have the stress of managing a team. You know, you have a team you manage. It's just never, ever easy. Yes. Right. It's never ending uh, firefighting issues that, that you know, so, so if you are in that space where you've, you've done, you know, quite a lot of deals in your life, it's time to just slow down and say, what can I do? Like literally just maybe do one deal a year mm. and then make as much money or more. Yes. Uh, but just really working a fraction of that, maybe yes. a quarter of that time, just working with a handful of professionals and, and a decent architect, a decent planner uh, and focus on one region because the more intimate knowledge you have, of that area and the mindset of the local planners, the easier it gets to be able to uh, deal with the planning hurdles, if I may say so. Yeah. And, and then the relationship you create with the planning officers in the region, that does make a big difference because you're almost reading their mindset. What is it that they're, because if you come across a, a old school uh, planner and he, he, he's just adamant to no changes around me, you, could, you you almost get into that mindset per, per, person's mindset. It becomes a lot more easier to deal with that person. Uh, you know, I came across this deal, not my deal, but at the same time, someone I'm learning from. Mm -hmm. The site, he took an option agreement. He's managed to build. The site had had, I think, 15 or 16 applications in the last 35 years wow. rejected. Wow. And he's managed to get planning. It's a, it was a brownfield site. He's managed to get planning permission for three houses, which when you walk in now, you can't even tell if it's a brownfield site or if it's a residential site, while the houses there are really posh, super high spec, each house probably worth about four million. Wow. He's managed to get planning permission for that. And to be able to understand the depth of that, mm -hmm. Not just that you understand the law and the policy in the country, the, the government policy, the national policy, the local policy, but you also understand the mindset of the local planners mm. to be able to get to that point. Yes. And now imagine if you, you know, this guy has taken an option agreement, he, he's bought that in a JV collaboration with the landlord, but imagine building a site that 
that's worth about 12 million mm. from thin air, really, yes. is, is, is not bought the site. And that's the space you can get to as long as you focus on learning the depth of planning, focus on learning the depth of the law in the country and the changes that are happening as we speak. Yes. And it's, it's almost like hard work, smart work. And because I've been through the journey of hard work, I always feel now that it's not just hard work that gets you there. It's more about slowing down and saying, okay, how can I look at a site and maximize its value? Either you want to just focus on planning uplift or maybe even develop it. That's entirely up yeah. to you. But then development means that you got to have a team or be able to hire a team that you obviously have to oversee and then obviously the exit as well. It's a, it's a whole journey of it. But then it's almost like focusing on maybe just one part of it because when you narrow it down, mm -hmm. it gives you more time to learn the depth of it. And the more depth you go into any subject, uh, I, I always feel there's more money. And, and this is, again, it's a learning journey. I've been through it. You know, you've seen me sometimes talking about half a million things at the same time and think you might be thinking in your head, what is Jack doing? But the focus always has been that narrowed down as much as possible because the more you do, the easier it gets. And the question was, if you are a seasoned investor, maybe now it's time to learn the depth of planning and yeah. say, this is where I'm going to focus and the least amount of effort it requires and the more rewarding it, it yes. is, I yeah. can share with experience. It reminds me of the uh, term, the riches are in the niches. Yeah. That uh, it's about going, uh, uh, you know, an inch wide and a mile deep on exactly, that one subject. Yeah. The more you know about your subject, the less competition you're going to yes. have because very few people will take the time to go that deep and exactly. really understand exactly. the subject. And it's interesting that as you were just sharing that, I was thinking about some of the uh, people that I know that have been in this business a very, very long time. Uh, they're, they're doing less now than they were. And when I was thinking maybe they're not, they're not in a growth mindset, they're not as hungry, but actually those few deals they're doing, there's so much margin on them that they're quite happy doing one or two deals a yeah. year. They don't want to do two deals every week. They're quite happy doing one or two a year one because there's two. so much profit margin because yeah. they're very selective about what they're getting that involved right. in. That is right. So, uh, so there's a running theme here of uh, creating value that doesn't exist yeah. through, uh, through uplift uh, and gain uh, in, in planning. So what is it that you look for? What's your ideal site look like for you? So when you're thinking of, okay, how can I get some um, uh, uplift on uh, this particular site? What is it that you you are looking for? What's what's a perfect site for you? Exactly what I shared right at, at, at the start of this, uh, this podcast, which is I want to walk down a road where there's a block of flats, anywhere between four to eight or nine. And then I, I walk further down, there's the exactly si same site size. And I can say, okay, because this president set, I can easily get potential uplift on that by, by through planning. That's what my ideal site is at the moment. Yes. Yes, I can still sit on a laptop and my average is that I can find a site every 10 minutes. Mm. So if I sit on a laptop for an hour, I can find six sites. Yeah. But the question is, what kind of those sites that I want to focus on? Mm. And that's my ideal because it's, it's what I have knowledge about and it's the easiest for me to deal with because I've dealt with it. Yes. Yes, I'm learning more depth to it, but that's the one I'm comfortable with to take, take risk with in the first place. Because remember, it's a lot of time investment when you are focusing on, on planning gain. Uh, so you, you, you may not lose a lot of money, but you can potentially lose a lot of time, which is the most valuable thing. So th that's my ideal site. It doesn't have to be yours. Uh, you can, I, I mean, because, like I said, because I'm a broker, I tend to see lots of people with different different angles on a, on a property. Uh, I'm coming across lots of people who are focused on town centers where this HS2 is going. Yeah. And because they know there's going to be potential uplift in value just purely because of HS2, uh, they want to they wanna acquire smaller pieces of land with high rises. Mm. Now, that's a great space to be in. But remember, high rises are not, not that easy either. Yes. There's a lot more, it's a lot more complicated when it comes to planning. It's a lot more complicated when you actually are talking about the build itself. So that's a space I'm learning about as we speak. But ideal site is just walk around a block of four, six, eight, nine units. And that's the easiest one to deal with. Yes. And it's interesting. I mean, we've got a train station literally just uh, over there, just been opening up, yeah. I think another year or so before it actually opens. It's yeah. been closed for 40, 50 years. 
and already in the area the price is slowly starting to creep exactly. up because it's very easy to jump on a train here and end up in London in like exactly. you know two two and a half hours exactly. um, so these when we are aware of infrastructure changes or investments you can see price rises oh, uh, can, that, yeah. that could happen yeah. and doing that research so where do you see the market going what do you see the opportunities of the next few years the next five ten years how do you think the market changing so everyone has a different opinion or, or let's say there's lots of different opinions in the market there's as we said some people think property markets finished as it was uh, other people are kind of packing their bags and looking for overseas a destination to go and live in and move to as well exactly yeah well what's your thoughts on the on the market over the next few years okay so i think there's no right or wrong answer here it's going to be a great gray area to look at but i always look at anything and say what did it look like? I mean, we have stats based on the property, uh, probably a uh, hundred years stats online that you can find on UK property market. And when you look at those numbers, remember everything has a compounding effect. In, in fact, let me share a very interesting story for everyone. I came across someone uh, who was a, a member of parliament uh, in UK. And he said to me, he said, we, we obviously, you know, get to know where the government is about to invest in certain towns mm -hmm. and if you can get hold of that information that means there's going to be a high up you know like the increase in the value of it so there's always opportunities like literally you can wake up one morning and you can be pessimistic and say there's just nothing there i'm going to move on or you can have a you know optimistic view thinking yeah. okay the half the glass is half full mm -hmm. it's really your own mindset of looking at something and saying you know so so opportunities are everywhere, like literally the opportunities that you see in UK market, I think you will be blown away in 20 years time. Mm. The question is, are you going to have the patience to stay around for 20 years and keep working on deals? So you could look back and, and I can assure you, you know, you, you would look back 20 years later and the house that you might be sitting in, if let's say it's worth about half a million, it'll be worth at least 1.25 in 20 years. Mm. The question is, do you have the patient, patience to sit on a deal like yes. that? Are you going to keep building and, and, and not sell it, potentially if you can, with low leverage? But there's loads and loads of potential. Uh, and, and if anyone thinks that it's a saturated market and wants to walk away from the country, and I've seen, come across lots of people who are walking, you know, going to Dubai or you know, some of the other countries, this is your time to buy these. In fact, this is what I call the buyer's market. Yes. I, I can lit literally sit on a laptop and I can find 20, 30% discounted deals, right? Have you learned the skill to find deals like that, be able to buy it and then sit on it for another two or three years? As soon as the market is back, the first 10% bump, you don't even, like, you won't even see it. Yes. You won't even see it. And then when you go back to the market, if you bought it 30% discounted, and when the market comes back up, if it's a 10% bump, that's a 40% equity in your portfolio, right? The question is, are you buying right now? So you buy it right now, yes. at the same time, holding the property, making sure that you, you're, you're making as much money on the property, you know, not necessarily just rent it out on a, on a single let, buy to let. Can you use it for essay, for example? Simple, but most people still don't do it. Mm. How simple it is to look at a property and say, I'm not going to give it on a, on a buy to let, I'm going to use it as an essay, mm. right? And it can generate at least double the money that you'd make on a buy to let, if not three or four times. Yeah. Uh, but people don't look at it like that. So, yeah. so I'm a very positive, uh, I have this optimistic mindset of looking at things and th saying, okay, I can make this work as long as I'm creative enough. And I just find... People don't study creativity enough. People don't ask the right questions. Uh, that is a skill and a half in yeah. itself. I think I, I, I think there is huge opportunity in the yeah. country. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And uh, the opportunity is always evolving, yeah. as we touched on earlier yeah. on. And it might not be the same thing it was two or three years ago, yeah. and it may not be the same thing in three or four more years' exactly. time. Yeah. But there's always some opportunity in property. And I've been in property nearly 18 years. And the amount of changes I've seen and, you know, if I'd stopped at the first change and says, oh, no, this doesn't work anymore. Yeah. You know, there's so much more I would have missed exactly, out on. Yeah. By, by evolving with the market, there's always new opportunities that are created. Uh, and you touched on uh, politics earlier. So yeah. let, let's uh, let's go there. Yeah, yeah. So we've been talking a lot about um, uh, planning and the 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 benefits that you can create from understanding planning and a lot of relaxation and changes have happened under this uh, conservative government. Yeah. 
and it seems at the moment it's very likely we'll have a, a Labour Prime Minister yeah. uh, in months to come. How do you think uh, planning might change under a Labour government? Yeah, um, I, I don't have a clear answer to that. W what I do know is at the moment, the central government is in a very diplomatic way taking some power away from the councils. Mm. And this change in the permitted development that has come now is, is an indirect way of taking away power from the local council and saying, we need more houses, we need people developing and so on and so forth. And, and that I feel wouldn't change. Yes. Okay. There's always going to be taking power away from the local councils because there's still a lot more, you know, with due respect, old school who don't want too many changes around. Yeah. Uh, that's going to remain very similar. It, it's not going to change. What I do think is that as long as, or not as long as, more like, okay, if we can have someone in power who can make the whole planning system or the policy system a bit more simpler, mm -hmm. which can happen, it will accelerate the process of building houses. Yes. And that's something we need in the country. Yeah. Either that would happen with labor or not, something I don't know, I've not read about it, but I would hope so. Yeah, there's a massive shortage of accommodations, yeah. so something needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, doing nothing is not an option. It's something option. needs to change. Something needs to change, yeah. yeah. Jack, I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's yeah. been uh, really excellent. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Uh, I think LinkedIn is uh, uh, your kind of preferred method. Yes, so just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, we are very, very active on LinkedIn, uh, Jack Davra. And yeah, if you, if you want to learn, we share lots and lots of uh, content uh, for absolutely free. Uh, you put lots of content out there on various yeah. different uh, platforms right, yes. as well, including uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, WhatsApp groups yeah. as well. So uh, we'll link up your details on the video and thank also you. under the video as well. Thank you. Jack, thank, thank you so you. much. It's, it's such been a pleasure. A pleasure. It's been an absolute thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.